if I start a business, I'm going to lose all my money. When in reality, it'll actually cost you nothing to start a business in today's world. The fear of what your parents will say, I had that. The fear is of what your friends will say, I had that. I think that that's ultimately it, because the moment you're not scared of what will happen, anything that happens will be a success, anything. So even if you came up with a brand name, learned how to build a website, it's so easy, and actually built it, that accomplishment to yourself will feel like, oh shit, I can actually do this. And I want to talk about the process of raising capital, because um, aside from those that want to build a lifestyle business, for me, I was always conscious about building a big business. And through my own journey, I realized that, you know what, a big part of it is raising capital. Um, something that is not really taught to you much and it's not really in business books and you know online as well a lot of people they've not lived it themselves so they can't really teach on it I guess the closest mainstream thing we have to it is Dragon's Den or Shark Tank in today's episode I'm joined by Sean Hanif CEO and founder of Genflow they've now reached a hundred million dollar valuation so this episode is going to be full of value they are a global agency that help influencers and creators build companies They've worked with the likes of Logan Paul, KSI, Anthony Joshua, and the list goes on. So let's get straight into it. Welcome to another episode of Recipe to Success. Today I'm joined by Sean Hanif. How are you, Sean? How's it going, man? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So obviously, pre uh, the episode, I've kind of given uh, the audience an idea of what you do and who you are. But why don't you give us a brief introduction as well? Yeah, no, sure. So how's it going, everyone? My name is Sean. Um, essentially, about six years ago, I left my job and started a business called Genflow. And what we do is we help creators, the people that you follow on social media, like Instagram, YouTube, etc. Essentially, I help them make money online. And it's turned into a massive business. Today, we're a team of 100 plus, I have offices globally, I've raised money, and we're worth more than $100 million. And I guess in short, very, very short, I've, you know, my, my personal story is very like a lot of other, let's call it Asian guys, um, to have to go to university, have to educate, that's the only path to success. That's what I thought it was, did it, actually went to university, studied accounting, but then I always knew that I have something else that I can offer, which is... I want to start my own business and I can help other people and kind of landed me into the thing that I do today. But yeah, I absolutely love it. I guess in the world of take it slow and do and, you know, uh, don't do too much and stuff. I'm probably the opposite thinking I'm like, I, I love what I do. So I do it all the time. And um, yeah, I'm excited to be here and let's, let's let's talk about it. Yeah, excited to have you here as well. Um, I think what's interesting is you've built this huge company um where we are today 2023 um but it didn't always start out like that uh, from knowing your story i know that you know you tried various things so why don't you give the audience a bit of context about you know briefly some of the things that led up to genflow yeah i guess firstly growing up i did a lot of online businesses and i'm talking early years so i was in like school sorry i was in like college 2004 5 6 so early days of like ebay and amazon so I guess, yeah, my kind of like background is I never actually had a job ever. I started learning how to buy and sell things. So I was a big power seller on eBay and Amazon. I remember at university, sorry, at college, I was making 5,000 pounds a month. And at that time, there's so much money as a 18 year old. And uh, I mean, I was just living the life because I had figured out a way where I could make so much money by just buying and selling things. So what that taught me is fast forward to now is how do you sell? How do you write copy? How do you understand uh, pricing, SEO and all those basic things? It fell into like I've always kind of been a bit of a nerd. So building websites, computers, all that stuff. And that led to. Um, you know, going to university, studied accounting, but kept my kind of like online hustle going and ended up getting a job um, in accounting, did that fully for three years, qualified in ACCA, but my mind was still always on the business. And I was lucky enough to work with some really cool clients. So I worked with Jamie Oliver on his app. Um, sorry, my accounting firm was the accountants for his app, which kind of gave me an insight into like iTunes and App Store in like two thousand, like early like two thousand and like twelve. Which, if you think about it, right, that's ten years ago. It's when iPhone was very new and just catching fire and all of that stuff. So I kind of fell into like the tech scene early, which meant I kind of upskilled myself early into a new thing that was about to happen, which was mobile phones led to social media, etc. So the whole like era of social media 
just becoming something. So yes, so then I left my job, um, wanted to start something on my own. And yeah, what Gemflow is today wasn't exactly what it was when I first started. The initial idea was I wanted to build a social media platform because I saw everyone making theirs. I thought it's going to work. And in those days, the whole thing was build a social media platform, Facebook mail, come and buy it for a billion dollars. So I just left my job, thought I'm going to do the same. Learned how to code, sat at home, made an app. It was called Nom Nom. We built it to like 40, 50,000 like monthly active users. Um, I raised a bit of money and hired a bunch of interns. And what I realized is I can't compete in social. And that's the wrong move. And you hear people talk about like pivot and like essentially it was a pivot because I was like, instead of social, I should focus on what I've always known been good at is buying and selling. So what I did was I was like, okay, people on social media, these influencers, they have something that they could sell. So, you know, you know, inadvertently, I'm like buying their content and selling it to others. But I did it in a way that essentially you're buying it end to end. And that's kind of what started Gemflow, which is October 2016, this idea of which seems so obvious now was that if you love someone online and you consume their content, you'll then be willing to pay to get extra content off them. And that's launched the business. And I guess we were early, it was timing. And at the same time, it was the awareness of people understanding online. So I think growing up all that buying and selling that I did is because I was doing stuff like, you know, selling take that tickets, even though I've never heard a song, but I know people want it, so I'm gonna buy and sell it. And I think that is something now growing up and realizing that's actually a very unique skill to actually understand what consumers want. Until this day, I think one of the reasons we are successful as a business and me is my understanding of consumers and what people actually want. So that comes from that same thing. So yeah, I guess that, that's the story basically. So pivoted, launched Genflow and um, yeah. So when you launched Genflow, it was the same concept as it is today. Yeah. But did you have that belief that it would get to where it is today? Because the creative space was very early then and, and also generating revenue through creator, creator's own platforms or creator's own hustles um, is not what it is today at, at that time. You know, the, the truth is, in general, I actually don't think like that. I actually don't think, is this thing going to work or whatever? I focus on what's in front of me and how can I make that work? So going back, it was December 2016. We just launched one of our creators and we sold um, £26,000 in a day. So when you do that yourself and it's right in front of you, you know this is working. So if the question isn't like, is it going to work? Is it going to become big? I always believe, of course it can. The question becomes is, can I go and find more creators and do the same thing with them to get to that same level of success again and again and again? And I think that's the thing that I always find myself in versus like, will this be big? I knew the answer to that because I remember exactly I was sitting in my pajamas at home in my parents' house on Boxing Day. We sold 26,000. I'm like, nobody knows about this in the world. I was convinced that how can you just sell? basically what happened was she did a post on Instagram. We sold 26,000. And I was like, nobody knows about this, that this is a thing. We didn't spend no money on marketing, no nothing else or whatever. And for anyone listening, right, any business book will teach you. Y Combinator, which is the a company that, you know, Dropbox and lots of other companies have come out from. The traditional thing with we taught as entrepreneurs is you find a problem, you build a solution, you then spend money on marketing, then you'll get customers. You you meant to make a few you meant to make losses for a few years, then finally become profitable and grow a business. Essentially this has completely flipped that. That we were like, I came up with an idea, pitched it to a creator, we put it live, we sell twenty six thousand, it's profitable in one day. And it's like, this is something. So I think I think I've, even now I feel like we're just touching the surface because of how big the whole thing is getting. So I think, yeah, I guess to the point, did I think I'll get this big? I think I was a consumer of content myself. So the question always was, will more people consume content and get value from it over time? The answer is yes. I did think that would happen. But obviously the way it's happened, even I could not have thought of it, that I think the creator economy now, as we call it, is worth like 500 uh, billion. It is just growing and growing to another world. I think I probably didn't think that creators will basically have the most power when it comes to marketing in the world over everything else. I think that obviously has been bigger than I assumed, but in my niche way, because I only consumed content of people and thought that was valuable, I thought these others like, and that's, that's the thing. Because if you think back now, even now, would you watch a YouTube video about some topic or do you buy a book on Amazon and read that? 
even though the guy on Amazon could be some doctor professor spent his whole life talking about you know fat loss but this guy who's jacked on YouTube you're like oh, I'll trust him instead right so the, the, it's the, almost the easier way to consume content as well it's so easy to get information and the consumer doesn't actually care the quality of the information in reality as long as you get what you want so because of that content creation and consumption is so big is why the business has grown essentially I find that super interesting. What 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 for me I think is um quite interesting is that that you know influencers can actually generate money. I think watching content versus you buying a product from this creator are two different things. And I I think a lot of people still don't believe in that necessarily, especially how, you know, in the UK especially how ASA got involved and they said, you know, now you have to put hashtag ad and you know versus when it was early. Um, and I think people still don't believe necessarily that you can build an audience and then actually sell something. So, how did that change over the years, and, and what did you see in like consumer behavior, considering that was your your thing that you understood? Yeah, I think I can say it from both sides, from the consumer side and the creator side. I guess on the consumer side, um, there was a period where you were being sold to and you didn't know. So you had to create content in such an organic way, but it's like saying, oh, I love this coffee, but I've been paid for it, but I have to pretend like I haven't been paid for it. So I think there was a period of that and creators had to be very careful and people are almost like looking out for like, oh, is it sponsored? But I think we've come through that now. And now where we are is that people are like, well, then you, if you're getting sponsored. So let's say if this podcast is doing amazing and that's, you know, a cup of Starbucks and they're paying you, people will be like, well done you, it's completely changed. Before it was like, how dare you have a Starbucks cup, like you sell out, you know, now it's like, they'll be like, well done, you've got, you're getting a bag from Starbucks, keep doing this. So I think public mentality has changed. I think as long as the thing that is relevant to the audience, nobody really cares if you're being paid to promote it anymore. So I think the key thing is relevancy. The thing is the right content. So when we work at the brand and you know, it's a creator, if it's the right stuff, it works in itself. So I think, that's, you're right, it's a misconception that the, like the influencer industry like doesn't work. It fundamentally works. Everybody makes money. The brands make money, creators make money, consumers love the products, they get recommended amazing things they never heard of before. Hence why it is the fastest growing like, um, you know, markets in the world and why brands want to pay so much money. Like you'd be surprised, like I did, we did a deal just last week. It was one reel for Sainsbury's 10,000 pounds. Like the amount of money you can make being a creator, it's unbelievable. But I still see these clips on TikTok and every stuff, oh, you could don't make no money being a creator. It's like, basically the, the people that don't make money in all of this game are the people that didn't build a following actually creating content about something. So if I do a, I'm gonna review all the phones and I'm a review channel, you will not make any much money besides ad reviews. And maybe some of those brands will pay you to review their product, but you don't really have an audience because people don't come for you. They come to see the review, if you see what I mean. But if people come to watch you and your opinion. So if you're an opinion leader or about something, create valuable content for a subset or niche of people, you then can make a lot of money. And then consumers don't mind as well because they're opting in to follow that person to be like, okay. So in the same example right here, if you, I don't know, promoted some business management software or a social media um, scheduling tool, let's call it later, you know, it would people would be like, oh, you run an agency of social media, you're telling me about this product, I'll check it out versus this must be a terrible product and you're only promoting it because you're getting paid, how dare you? I think no one thinks like that anymore because they're trusting you because they already trust you because they follow your content, if you see what I mean. So for any creators watching, how important is authenticity then? I think, yeah, I think, well, I, when I speak to creators, then the number one thing, and for anyone listening that's like trying to create some content, it's the same topic, right? That what do you create content about? So you're authentic, you're real, and you build the best possible audience that you can then monetize. The question comes is like, who are you making content for? And I think a lot of people don't know that part. They're trying to create content that for themselves. So classic example is, I can be like, I'm gonna create content about football, UFC, business, music. Basically, I'm gonna create content about everything I'm interested in. When it needs to be create content about what the person you're trying to target is gonna find valuable. It's the other way around. Then it works. So when it comes to building a genuine audience, really, if you are if you are solving a problem for a subset of people, you naturally are building an audience which is gonna be authentic because you're genuinely trying to help them through your content. And I think that that's the thing. And once you have that, that content can be monetized very well. 
Mm, okay. I want to move uh, a little bit over to um, some of the actual day to day of Genflow. Um, mm-hmm. We spoke of camera that, you know, we're both in the agency space, which is the first for me, by the way, in different ways, um, for sure. But I think some of the problems and the hardships, they cross over. Um, so I want to talk about the early years of uh, Genflow and how you got through some of those problems that typically happen in the agency. Yeah, I think the problems that happen in agency, number one is um, you need to hire a team. And most people probably hire the wrong team. And I was in fact, let's, well. let's go, let, sorry to cut you off, but let's go back a little bit because I think there was this wave where, you know, online Ty Lopez, you know, came up, you know, he, he took over the scene. He was like, you know, there's this whole business idea, social media is here and, you know, why don't you start an agency? And I think that um, kind of changed a lot of people's lives because they believed in this concept. Um, what I didn't agree with that concept personally, because, um, you know, I did start my agency in 2017. So it was around that era. What I didn't necessarily believe was that you build this agency, um, you're a one man team, you um, essentially work from a beach all day and uh, that's it, right? And and they didn't ever tell you about, you know, how to retain clients, how to build it to a bigger agency than 10K a month, for example. And so what, what started to happen was people would start opening the agencies and then they would just close it or after a few months you would see no activity. So for me, I always felt that I wanted to build a, build a real business as opposed to just a you know lifestyle agency. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit as well. No, I think it's a very good point actually, and just for context for everybody. So Ty Lopez, I guess one of the big internet marketing gurus, um, he launched a course. It was one of the first courses that really caught fire in the world. It was an SMMA course. It was the escape the 95, build your agency. And you can basically like, um, you know, li- live the live the high life. And the truth is that 90% of courses you still see today are probably that same type of content recycled. That's the reality. And I think you touched upon it really well. So there's a lifestyle agency or a real business. Like go and look at, go, if, if you're interested in launching an agency, go and check out WPP. You know, they're, they're worth billions of dollars listed on the stock market and they go and buy other agencies. And that's what you call an agency or, Others that I know of that are massive would be AKQA and lots of others like that. The point is you will not hear of them in the same way as you'll hear some of the ones that you probably come across and think, wow, this is a massive agency because there's some guy on YouTube that started it. So yeah, I guess the problem is that everyone thinks agency is the shortcut. Agency is actually a very hard business to launch and manage. It's way easier, in my opinion, to launch a direct-to-consumer brand than an agency because the indirect consumer is all about you in an agency Basically, what you're saying is you're going to go and sell services to a bunch of people and then you're going to try to keep them happy. This idea of you're going to start an agency and you're just going to find contractors abroad and they'll do all the work, they'll manage all the stuff. So this is the classic thing where every agency is like automate your sales funnel. Um, they're going to set up this thing and completely in auto, you're going to sign clients. You're going to onboard clients completely auto. And then some people are sitting offshore that you're paying such less money to are going to run the whole thing for you and you don't have to touch anything. Basically, that's the big lie that's told in the agency space for sure. I, I never believed that, of course, and I've kind of seen it from afar. But I guess, yeah, building an agency in the early days is, is very tough. It's very tough. And it, it, people that can get through that. And what, it, what I mean by that is, I did a post on it recently, can you get like five clients and keep them for like six months? If not, then it's probably not for you because client etiquette is something that not a lot of people have because clients are always right. You know, in, in 99% of the times, it's just the truth. And you just have to, you can't be, if it's not in you to be like that and then servicing somebody, then it's not for you. Mm, okay. And Fast forward, obviously you built Genflow from the ground up. You, uh, I remember seeing this video, I think it was during COVID time, where you kind of spoke about that you were leading to that path of trying to build it to a hundred million dollars. Yeah. Um, you're now there. Um, and I wanna talk about the process of raising capital because um, aside from those that wanna build a lifestyle business, for me, I was always conscious about building a big business. And through my own journey, I realized that, you know what, a big part of it is raising capital. Um, something that is not really taught to you much and it's not really in business books and you know online as well a lot of people they've not lived it themselves so they can't really teach on it I guess the closest mainstream thing we have to it is Dragon's Den or Shark Tank so how did that process look for you you had done it prior to Genflow even you had done it with other businesses so how did you know that was important and and how did you go about you know finding investors and 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 having a pitch and 
I, th- I think firstly, if context, I've raised about fifteen million dollars for for Genflow. Um, could have raised more, but I decided like that's the amount, and that is a very hard thing. And I remember coming up myself is like a big black box. You know, it's the unknown, and it still is in real. Like you said, I think the first question ever comes to any founder is, um, why do you want to raise money? Like, what would you actually do with the money? So let's say it happens. So let's say even right now is social awaken. If you're saying if I had ten million dollars, I could do this, 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 right? And I think it's just that they're like, okay, so if if you had the money, as soon as you leave this room, you have ten million in the bank. What happens? And that's when most people will actually fail. Is why they'll never raise because they can't actually put together like a actual strategy. And so to answer the question of how to find investment stuff is all easy, and I can get to that in a second. The first very thing for anyone listening that ever wants to raise money is who. What's the strategy? What are you actually going to do with that money? Um, and how can a potential investor believe you that you'll be able to deploy that capital, build the return, and they'll be able to get something from that? I think, and that's like the whole thing that most people are just unable to do, which is, um, you know, this is what I would do with the money in the most smartest way, and why you can trust me to do it. So I think. That's the number one thing. If you have that there, then it's the question of yes, who do you go and find, and how do you find them, and and the rest. But but yeah, raising capital is a, is an amazing way to grow your business if you have like the stomach for it. So we'll get into that. But okay, so just for the layman's term, someone who's never been in business, right? So raising capital means you raise uh, some cash, you raise some money in return for equity. Which naturally, if you started the company from 100%, it means you're diluting yourself to raise this money. So I still meet a lot of people to this day that would say, you know, I'd rather have 100% ownership. Why would I want to dilute? So just for those people, what are some of the benefits of doing so? Comes down to your end goal, right? So like you said, I think people confuse two things a lot, which is lifestyle business and a big business. In lifestyle businesses, you want to own them 100%. You want to make it as lean as possible. You want to have as many of them as possible, and earn a few thousand pounds from every single one of them. And and you know, I mean, that's your thing. And you know, coming up, you'll see a lot of like uncles and family members and stuff doing that. Especially right? like, in the Asian community, man, they'll know, say, "Why are you giving equity away?" <laughs> and, and you know that, and that's that. And I think, um, and that's why, like, you know, we have, I have, like, you know, if someone's got like a shop and they've been doing it for ten years, but the point is, you're not trying to grow. When it comes to a business, which you would, which I classify as like an actual business. Firstly, there's a fundamental things, right? That if you're not growing as is a real business, then what are you doing? So you should be looking to grow at least like 20% year on year as a business, because that means you're actually progressing. Because if you're spending all your time doing something and that one thing, so the um, you want to grow, and it comes down to the goal. So I guess with any business, the goal would be to exit at, in some way. What exit means is that you're going to go and sell your business or a part of your business to somebody. There's many ways to sell a business, either selling it all. Um, you're listing it for an IPO on the stock exchange, where you can then decide how many of your personal shares you want to sell, or you're part selling it to a strategic investor, a private equity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There isn't a successful business in the world that has never been sold at some point for some value. It's actually so common. So, and I think if people are very uneducated, uneducated to that world, that this idea of that I'm going to own my business for 50 years and do it is actually like shows your inability to grow something. So when I see that, I'm like, so you've had this like thing. Like in our family, we have a furniture warehouse business. They're one of the biggest furniture suppliers. Like it's amazing. There's like probably ten million a year, but it's been for thirty years. And there's pride in that. Don't get me wrong. But I look at it and be like, how have you not grown this thing in thirty years? If that's the only thing you guys have been doing, um, it's just a different way of thinking. Um, so back to the big business side. Um, so the way it works is yes, you will find an investor, and they would want equity because they are hoping for a big exit one day. What's different about my world? When I say my world, let's call it startups, tech agencies, agencies, etc. It's not like Dragon's Den, Shark Tank, where someone's like, "I'll give you a million or a hundred thousand, sorry, and I want money back in two years." So with my investment as well, like there's no dividend payout. The investor is not looking for quick cash back. This is not money on top of money. So when you're you know, to the local investor that you know, or some guy with money, that's not the money you want as well. We can talk about like types of money out there. You want actual money, which is institutional money. You don't want like private money. So if I'm a rich guy and I'm like, I'll give you some money, it's going to come with so many strings attached, and you don't want that in your business because that also can be bad. So I think when it comes to raising money, you are essentially getting married to somebody. 
So you have to be so clear on like, are you looking with the right person, finding the right person for your business? Because it can easily ruin you as well. Um, and I think that's why it's a, it's something you have to really think about if you want to do it. So you said you, you raised about $15 million just for GenFlow alone. What are some of the pressures that come with that? Because like you said, if you've got the stomach for it, um, I think, you know, it sounds good. Let's raise money. Let's build this big business. And even if I have got the strategic ideas of how I'm going to execute that and achieve that and then someday exit, um, people don't really talk about what happens in between. And uh, you actually have to do it. So that's the thing, right? So I think if it's your own business and you have no one to report to, not answer to, I'll say report to, you became, it makes you lazy because you will accept your own fate of like, it's okay. You know, like we've got the same clients as last year. I'm still making the same. Maybe personally you're taking out 150, 200 grand from the business a year, whatever that number is, you're comfortable. So I think for me is like having investors doesn't make you comfortable, which is a good place to be. The reason is it works like this, like right now, general example. So for this year as GemFlow, we have a forecast which I have to submit to the board, obviously, which I'm I'm part of the board and so is our investors. And then our goal, I'm telling them, it's not them telling me, and that's the big misconception as well, like you don't work for investors. That was actually one of my final questions. So we had a bunch of offers and my final question to them was, to the different parties was, what's it gonna be like working for you? And the one that I picked, which was BGF, um, she responded with, you won't be working for me, we'll be partners. And that was it for me because that's the number one thing. I'm not working for nobody. It's still my business. You're just giving me money and I'm going to get you a return in a few years and you're going to help me strategically to get there. That's why I'm, and, and the money's going to help and you're going to help. So coming back to our thinking, so, you know, last board meeting, you know, this is the forecast for the year. How are we tracking against that? And this is where we want to get to. And the forecast I created, meaning that I want to grow this business this year, you know, um, close to 50% growth year on year. If you can achieve 50% growth as a business, you're regarded as a, f- a fast growth business in the world because that means every year you're growing by 50% compared to the previous year. And I think that's what the benefit is, but also means that you actually have to deliver it. It's like saying in simple terms, you get a personal trainer and um, the goal is to get abs and you're going to measure your body fat and your measurements every single month or they can see your food every single day and there's no getting away from it. Or it's the guy that's saying that, yeah, I'm training, I'm doing well, but there's no one holding him accountable. This kind of forces accountability out of you, out of your team. And it's one of the easiest things I can use to my team to be like, oh, the board want this done, so we got to get it done, <laughs> versus me. So, yeah, I guess that's the benefits of it. What I mean by like having the stomach is just ultimately, do you generally want to build a big business? Or is that something you like the idea of? because it's very hard to build like a big company. Um, I mean, you have a hundred plus team, the amount of opinions, team members, managing people, which leads me on to one of the hardest things about this whole thing is like people, like having a hundred people that you have to look after. There's obviously gonna be some people that don't agree with you, don't like you, don't like what you're saying, your method, your style of working, because it's impossible to please so many people. And that's probably been the biggest challenges for me in this that comes with raising money in a big company. Mm -hmm. And you spoke about earlier in the podcast that, you know, for you, you wanted to build this big business and you had kind of gone through that process of, you know, buying and selling things on Amazon prior to that and stuff like that, but you never had a job. And I think one of the funny things that I find is we as business owners, we start something, we we have as founders, we have this idea, we want to execute it but we were never put in that job. We chose to be put in that job. Yeah. So how do you learn the intricate details of actually running, like really doing it, not just for YouTube or content, but really running a business in day to day? How did you kind of grasp that? And how did you evolve? And what, what were some of the changes that you had to make? I think for me, like most questions I get asked, is a lot of people want to, the people that are like, I want to start something, but don't know how, like those people that shouldn't start something because it means you naturally just don't have it in you. It's like saying, I want to get fit, but I don't, like you can just go outside and start running, but people just don't do that. But we'll still keep saying, I want to get fit. I have a million reasons why they can't get fit. So for me, like, I'll be honest, like I'm just pure operational person. Like this morning, I was trying to figure something out on Webflow on one of our clients' websites, because I was trying to edit it. So I think, so how to learn, how to do whatever is just by doing it. Like it's, it's the most simplest answer, but so many people don't have it in them to be like, let me try. 
So in the early days it was designing, it was ads management, it was development. You know, there almost isn't anything in the business that I haven't touched myself and that gives you this ability of like I can do anything. Like just for context for everybody as well, you know, we help creators launch different brands and um, sell content, work with other brands as well. But when it comes to like selling product, it's the same thing because I'm so fascinated by this. It's the same thing. So right now I'm working on a productivity drink, let's call it. I had to learn about what does cognitive ingredients mean? How does it work, etc. So this constant thing of wanting to know how it works myself gives me the edge basically. Mm. Um, yeah. And and li- you, you mentioned people like, you know, that was one of the hardest things in your journey is, is you know, the complexities that come with managing people. Um, what do you think makes a good leader? I think for me, it's clarity. Having clarity on um, uh, how do you want something done? I think a lot of people like put, they have an expectation of how work should be completed. And you know this first hand. So if you're like, go away, make some social media posts, but they send it through and they're like, and you're like, what's this? is because mostly you probably wouldn't be clear enough to be like, this is what I wanted. I wanted long form captions. I wanted this. You don't use these words. Here's the guidelines. Like being as descriptive as possible. So I think what makes a good leader is who, I wouldn't say lead from the front. It's more like pushes from behind because you're pushing them into being able to get the thing done. Um, That's probably the number one thing. And I think second, I would say is people, um, dealing with people like people, understanding them. And spending enough time with them so you can um, understand what makes them tick. Because everyone has a slight different like button you need to push. Um, especially when it gets tough and there's lots of things to do and all that sort of stuff. So I think for me, probably those two things. Uh, it's like in football, you have man management, knowing your people. and uh, I agree in that 100%. Yeah, so I think man management for sure. Um, I think you also got to remember what's in it for them. That's a constant thing. So I like when it's Black Friday, I get this big speech to the company. I'm like... I know everyone's thinking, why am I going to bust my balls to make the company the most money it's ever made? Because we want to have the best, biggest Black Friday. I get it, right? But you're thinking in the wrong way. What you should be thinking about is, I want to help this creator, like, you know, sell a million in a month because you're doing it for you. So you can then know that I achieved that. And that is how you build confidence in life. And it unlocked a lot of things for a lot of people mentally because it went from like, why should I care? I'm, not, I'm just still going to get my salary. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still going to get my bonuses. So why does, why does it bother me? Which is the classic way of someone thinking that what do I get from it? When you can do always something to get if you think of it in the right way. Um, and that was it, you know, and that, that imp- uh, hopefully, you know, empowered people to go and, and do stuff that you remember. Because the thing that drives me the most is achievements. And like I launched an app, hit number one on the app store. How many people can say that in the world? Um, obviously, I worked with Anthony Joshua that I signed from nowhere. We did his product, I stocked up stadiums. Um, you know, coming from the UK, he was one of the biggest stars. Who would ever thought like I'll be doing that? So actual achievements. Um, last week, we had one of our apps globally featured by Apple on the home of the App Store, meaning anyone in the world opened the App Store. Our app was right there at the front. So people that work on that stuff, I'm like, you need to realize like life is about moments and achievements, and this is some of it. So if you had a job or whatever, stop thinking, what's in it for me? What do I get out? It's not all monetary. It's also like what you're actually doing and what that feels like. And and learn that, I think in the moment, not enough people like cherish that I've just done this. I've just done that. What it means. It means that I came up with something and it was amazing. And like, I'm amazing now. Because I think that's what gives you the ability to like, I can do anything. Mm. Do you think that people need to be managed differently now? like you you mentioned uh, your family comes from like furniture world and stuff like that and I, me personally I think that managing people was very different let's say 20 years ago you could just say you know do this and get the job done and people were willing to do it but I think now people have so much access to information and they, they do care about their selfish wants more than just you know getting the job done and getting a salary at the end of the day so do you think that you have to manage people differently versus the old school route? I think before it was through fear so I think Previously, when you were managing uh, people, there was an air of fear because you don't want to lose your job. Um, you know, and I, I and I, and I think what's now it's about um, it's about the value that um, someone's going to sign to get. So I think for me, the, as a founder, your main job is that you should always be selling to your employees, 
And I think that's like a new concept. Before it was through fear. I think now you literally are marketing to your employees that why you should do this, why this is an amazing thing for you. Of course, they they work for you and all that stuff. But even just the why, if people understand the why, they're like, okay, I get it. I'll I'll do it for that reason. So I think yes, people want to know the reason for them personally. And there's always a way to make someone realize like what's in it for them. Is there anything that you wish you did differently in your journey? Yeah, so many things. I guess um, obviously as a business, strategically, I've made so many moves. Obviously, some of them cost you money. Um, and um, yeah, it's a good question. I think um, I think differently. I made a mistake of hiring like very expensive, experienced people. I wouldn't do that again. I would advise other people not to do that. So I kind of always thought I'm good, but when you get to like sixty people, so like thirty people, you think you're good. Forty people, fifty people, sixty people. But when it's sixty people, it's millions of pounds. It's getting more and more complex every day. I'm sitting in a meeting where we're like talking about like leggings and different materials. I'm like, I know enough, but I'm like, I'm starting to now feel like I'm slightly out of my depth. Or we're talking about, you know, if it's freight and how things need to be packaged to go to a supermarket. It's like, I'm out of my depth. So I started to like kind of feel a little bit like, okay, I need to bring in experience. And everyone says, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about this stuff. People like hire a team and let them get on with it and all this stuff. So I kind of believed. It. I believed the textbooks. I believed what people are saying. And most of the advice is from people that have not actually done it themselves. And I think that's the reality. So I kind of fell for it. Did it. Hired, hired experienced people. But they just didn't work in my business. Not that the people weren't right or they don't have experience. It's context is a big thing in business. Context. Um, so if you work at a large business that has been around for ten years, fifteen years and they have hundreds of millions of revenue, if you pluck someone from there and drop it into your business, they will be absolutely clueless. And that's why I kind of found that I'm like, I got very expensive people, lots of experienced, insane CVs. I'm like, wow, imagine if that guy comes and joins me, what will we be able to achieve? So I think my lesson big is that you got to keep building the way, okay, what, you know the saying of like, what's got you there is not what's going to get you to the next thing? That's actually false. It's like what's got you there is exactly the thing that's going to take you forwards. You just keep doing more of it, more of it. People try to start to pivot. So what people will do is launch more services as an agency or create more verticals as a brand. If you're a brand like a supplement brand, you start doing clothing. And it's like, you know, do you really need to do that? That's a whole other world. So, um, so that's what I mean by you don't. Yeah. What's got you there? is exactly what's going to get you forwards. You just need to get better at doing it, learn how to scale, how you're going to find more customers and all that stuff. It's not um, the next, like they need to do something different. And when you bring in new people, lots of people, you will start doing things differently. So I th as an agency owner, one of the biggest things is like your SOPs, like the way you do something essentially is the art in an agency. And if you hire lots of people, different people from different backgrounds, different experiences, they will start to disrupt that because they genuinely will be like, well, in my last company, we did this and I have more experience than you. Technically, I know this is your business. So this is the right way to do it. Hmm. And that's a massive challenge that I can't like downplay because you're conflicted with smart people who know what they're talking about but they don't have the particular context of your industry, niche, et cetera. And especially in my game, because you work with creators, which are like other kids, it's not a business. So let's say you work with brands, which means your staff must speak to like someone at the brand who's also working there. Can you imagine if you were speaking to a 19 year old creator and you're trying to tell her, no, no, this is how, this is how it works. They'll be like, I don't care. Like I want my edit to look like this. <laughs> That's me. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. such a different world that I live in. So, um, I think that's probably my biggest thing I would say when it comes to things I would do differently. And do you have any non-negotiables in business? Because I think when we start out, we definitely have this dream. We have this kind of goal of, of what we want to achieve. And I think along the way we learn whether that's investors, employees, partners, whatever it may be, there's certain things that we're not willing to put up with in our ship that we're trying to steer. So for anyone that is listening that may gain some value from that, what are some of your non-negotiables in business? I think for me is um, like staying true to your word. So if you're going to say you're going to do something, then do it. Or if you try to do it and you couldn't get it done, like wherever it was, one of the worst qualities in team members is and people that I work with is if I have to chase them 
to find out about the thing that they were meant to be doing, but they never like, I, there, there should be no need for that. I think that's my number one thing. Good people do that naturally. They be like, hey, I know you asked me to do this or, you know, I'm working on this. I haven't got it done yet. It'll be this. That's cool. But it's the non-communication and not st- like sticking to what you said you're going to do. So I could say, so when can you do this then? By this date. Cool. So I'm just going to ask you on that date, where is it? I should, And if it's not done, why? I shouldn't have to chase you. So I think that's probably my number one non-negotiable. Number two, um, every piece of work has to be your best work. So I openly ask them, is the best work, you've, is, this, is this your best? And a lot of people will stutter and be like, is it a trick question? Like, what does it mean? Why are you asking me that? It's like, yeah, but because that's what it should be. So if you generally haven't put your best effort into something, then why, why, why? Why are you handing it in? Yeah. <laughs> like, why? So I think that that, and I think last, um, I don't believe in second chances. I think people show the true colors naturally. And that's how I've learned that the hard way, the amount of money I've lost chances given to people waiting six six months for team members to get better clients to get better now we remove clients in an instant like the moment a client isn't doing or isn't is just not going to be the what we needed to be it just has to end um this is it's not personal so i think so i think it's all interrelated but i would say yeah the um yeah that'd probably be the main things mm. and Let's talk about you, right? As a yeah. as a as an entrepreneur, as a, a thought leader, you know, someone who's trying to achieve massive excellence. Um, you you mentioned accountability that you have with your investors and obviously making this goal happen. But what I find is that people talk very holistically in business. They don't talk about the day to day discipline. They they don't talk about you know the fact that you actually have to get the work done yourself as well. You've got a team, but you have to be a great leader. You have to do the thing. So how do you stay motivated and, and, and disciplined in your day to day? Apart from obviously, you know, the goal of wanting to make it happen. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's a very, very good question. I think first you gotta love what you do generally. That it doesn't really matter how many employees I have. I mean, all of that stuff doesn't really actually matter. It's like, what are you actually doing when you wake up every day and, and do, right? So I think I'm very organized. I don't need help being organized. Like I'm, I'm organized in my mind. So what that means is that I'm very good at knowing what things should I focus on. And that gives me direction. So that means you wake up and I have my day planned out. I'm very big on using my calendar, using time blocks and essentially having uh, everything planned out. So for example, after this, um, I have a one hour session with my leadership team. We'll be going through, um, I guess, generally speaking, would be the key priorities that they are working on and any commercial decisions that they have that they need to discuss with me which could be, um, I know we're currently negotiating a Sainsbury's for a brand. Um, there's some terms they need to look at. Um, straight after that, I'm having a call with um, two of my colleagues. We are pitching um, like a new app to somebody. So like it's all organized because I have made sure like that. So the point is like I organize my time so well and then I objectively look at it to be like things. So I guess, yeah, the day to day is that you got to love that. Like there isn't a Slack message that I don't respond to within five minutes whatever time of night or day or whatever i'm not the type of person that's never not available i'm available at all times and i know some people are thinking like that sounds like crazy it's too much or whatever so i'll touch upon one other point regardless this obviously i have a three-year-old daughter i'm very present for family and all that stuff and again because that's a block on my calendar so um, probably like 7 till like 10 generally speaking 7 p.m till 10 p.m so i have dinner with my family every single night um, in case I'm traveling or something. So people have this misconception, right? Like hustle culture, working all the time. So you don't care about nobody else, just your business. It's just not true. You can be the absolute best dad and the best entrepreneur at the same time. This is not, this is like, it's just not related. It just comes down to organization. Yeah. And I think that's where people, you know, I think if you just reduce the time that you waste in your life, you can manage it. And then it's about communication. So I guess with me and my wife, it's, she's on board the plan. Yeah, I'm not like having my business and she doesn't know about it or what we're trying to achieve in her life. So we've said it to each other, look, three to five years, it's going to be like this, which by like this, meaning that like, I have to get the stuff done. You know, all this stuff is super important. And she has to make sure the family is running in the right way and all of that stuff as well. And I, I'm looked after and I make sure she looked after. But the point is we have a goal as in life. 
But in five years from now, it could be completely different because life is in chapters. And I think a lot of people are trying to find like this um, unbelievable balance or serenity or, you know, comfort zone that is going to go on forever. Again, because when you look at our parents or what people say, that's what success looks like, that you're meant to just have this nice, cushy life forever and then retire when life is ups and downs. So I really cherish that. Like, you know, right now, if I got a phone call and we have to do something and it's going to take us like 48 hours of non-sleep, I'll be like, let's do it. Because that's okay. But do you never, I mean, in your journey, like I'm sure when you started, you had a certain number that you wanted to hit. And what I find is, is a lot of founders and a lot of uh, kind of companies that built, they, their number always changes. Like, let's say they started off saying, you know, I want to exit for 10 million. Then it changes to 20, then it changes to 50, then it changes to 100. If they get to that journey. But then there's also a lot of people that get to a certain number and they think, you know what, I'm, I'm actually, I'm done. Like I'm, I'm mentally checked out. I can't do this anymore. I cannot deal with this pressure anymore. I could just be sipping on some mocktails in uh, Dubai. Um, and, you know, I've achieved my goal and I'll probably go on to something else. So I guess my question is, you know, what keeps you going in that, in that yeah, sense? I think I'm quite blessed with my business because we're not just do one thing. So like I was just mentioning, we're doing productivity drink. Obviously productivity becomes massive. Uh, nootropics have become massive as an ingredient. So it's just about understanding. So I think for me, I'm quite blessed with like, I can evolve with the business. So that makes me not wanting to stop. So I think you're right, it's not about a number. The number is I want to keep on growing. Up till when, we'll see. I just love creating, love building, love doing new stuff, um, educating myself, building things. Right now, I'm building like AI stuff now because obviously now it's so much easier. I did some Web3 stuff last year. Um, so I think, and I think that's probably like the right entrepreneurs. It's like, it's, 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 it's the, the game is forever. There is no end. But have you, I mean, your investors definitely have, but have you kind of pictured it exit and- Yeah, so I think for me, like if, what I mean is like, so as an entrepreneur, it's a forever game. Um, when You'll move right, on to something else, yeah. When the sure. right point comes and financially, if it makes sense, and I'm sure it will, to sell this business and move to something else. Like, of course I will make the strategic movement. It's like Ronaldo leaving Real Madrid and joining my new. That's the way I see it. So if my GemFlow journey ends one day and I'll start something else, but my journey as an entrepreneur of building, learning, doing. That's you as a person. Yeah, I'm not chasing some beach. I can sit on a beach today, right? But like a third day on sitting on a beach, then what? So I think if you love building, you just love building. And I think that's the difference. The people that are doing it, that it's going to be lots of money. So if you think business is going to make you rich, like it's going to be very tough. Um, you'd rather stick to your job where your money is almost guaranteed as long as you hit your stuff and no pressure versus trying to do something forever. Because even in a client face thing, clients are not there forever. After a few years running an agency, if you don't like scale and grow, it's going to diminish. As a brand, you could be selling a certain product that's killing it. In a few years, it won't no longer be killing it because something else will come along. So there is just, there's no forever in business, but there's a forever in being an entrepreneur. So I focus on that. That's why I think, you know, honestly, like I've never even think like, oh, this is the number I'll exit. I think, am I open to exiting? Of course, because um, I want to do it as a success thing. That I built something and sold it more so than the money, but the money obviously comes with it because you deserve it. For, for building it yeah 100 so percent. my final uh question um is you you are someone that has not only thought of an idea and executed it but done it on a scale that most people cannot even fathom right um and you know i th- I, I personally feel that a lot of the uk or just the western culture in general people are lazy like they want the easy way out they want that being on the beach and sitting, you yeah. know, sipping the mocktails going for the money as opposed to the legacy or what you're trying to actually solve in business um and it leads to a lack of actually doing the thing like actually really going out and building it and even if they start something they give up very quickly because they're like i'm not making that kind of money now so if you could concisely say you know some of your biggest pieces of advice for the youth of today of actually building a business and someone that maybe looks up to you what would your advice be the biggest advice i can give someone is um just stop living in fear It's the biggest thing. If you are working today, you have a fear of, if I start a business, I'm going to lose all my money. When in reality, it actually costs you nothing to start a business in today's world. The fear of what your parents will say, I had that. The fear of what your friends will say, I had that. I think that that's ultimately it, because the moment you're not scared of what will happen, 
anything that happens will be a success. Anything. So even if you came up with a brand name, learned how to build a website, it's so easy, and actually built it, your accomplishment to yourself will feel like, oh shit, I can actually do this. And the next day, now let me figure out what service I could offer, what skill do I actually have in this world. Okay, I'm actually quite good at editing or maybe marketing or copywriting. I was always good at English. Okay, copywriting. I'll be a copywriting agency. Okay, so it's a step by step. So I think just fear, lose the fear and just go for it. They have nothing to lose. Um, and if you can't, then just understand once and for all that it's not for you. And that's okay. And just get Not everyone really, needs to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, and I think just get really good at your job and kill it in the job. Because even like... So yeah, I think that would probably be the biggest thing that I see for the non-starters. Um, I think any advice for any founders that are, I guess, at an earlier stage than me would be double down on what's working versus trying to do new things. It's so easy to be like, I want to do new. So let's say if you're doing social media services for businesses and hospitality, that's still a massive opportunity. You don't need to touch nothing else ever. And even in that, you can probably build a, a massive company. So I think that's what a lot of people don't do is like just focus on what's working and become the best at that. People start diversifying into so many things, um, which means you're not an expert at anything really, especially and, when it comes to marketing. And this also links to Genflow, but um, your biggest thing right now is create content if you're a founder. Yeah. I think that that, that goes without saying. So I think if you are stuck with like, I want to start a business, I want to do something, the thing you should do today actually is first start creating content. So going back to the copywriting example, you should try to actually create some content around copywriting first before you're trying to sell services to somebody because you'll also realize are you actually good or not and you, how are you going to find customers. So what I would do, this, this is what I'm talking about being a practical person. Go to companies' websites, look at the copy they're currently using, rewrite it because you think you know better, send it to them. Cr sorry, create content about that firstly so you can say, what's going on? Here's... Um, Here's Gemflow's copy on the website. These are three reasons why it's shit. I've rewritten it. This is how it should be. And just post it. And do one reel per day doing that for different companies. Before you know it, a company will DM you and be like, hey, this is great. Could you do it for us? And then just like that, you land yourself a client. So I think I call that the audience first model. It's like you build the audience before you're going to sell the thing. So when people are stuck on their idea or the thing they want to do, when they the best way to prove it is by just doing it and do content first. So I think, yeah, and any founder, I think if you listen to this, you should be creating content with every possibility. You know, it's hard time and all the stuff. I get it, but still one post is better than zero. So it's just, again, just starting it one step at a time. Um, that's what you need to do. Love it, man. Honestly, been an honor. Something I've been uh, wanting to happen for a couple of years now, for I know, sure. It's been a few years. We we sat down with uh, Saad yeah. like a few years ago, um, and even then we spoke about. It. He was like, you know, you definitely need to get Sean on. He's someone that you know has got a lot of value to give. Um, so I'm really, really glad that it's, it's finally happened. Um, for anyone that you know wants to follow you, where's the best place for them to check you out? Yeah, I guess uh, it's just my name, Sean Hanif, on Instagram. Currently about sixteen thousand followers. I'm putting a bit of effort into that as well now. I've got posts going out every day. Uh, building LinkedIn, YouTube, I think everywhere it's just Sean Hanif, if you search you'll see me, I'm sure there'll be links as well and I have my own podcast called Life of an Entrepreneur which I kind of take you behind the scenes of what it's like being an entrepreneur so check that out, you'll find a lot of value there. Definitely, we'll put all the links in the bio, thank you for watching, be sure to subscribe, like, comment, all that good stuff and we'll see you soon.